Hi folks, recently I shared a video about a necrotic uh, uh, canine that was calcified and I talked about the use of SSC for getting down such teeth, uh, both with hand and rotary instrumentation. And a good question came up and the question was, why did this tooth go necrotic? Obviously it was kind of virgin but it had become calcified and gone necrotic. And I thought that was a very good question, worth sharing. Okay, so let's take a quick look and find out why a canine tooth, as in the case that I showed you in the previous video, can go necrotic despite minimal restoration. Now, let's just quickly draw this tooth here. The canine tooth that we had uh, on the case that I kind of shared with you guys had, in fact, a little bit of a half moon type of a composite restoration on the distal aspect of it. And these teeth, with the uh, composite restoration, even though the restoration can be very shallow, for various reasons, primary reason of which is inadequate bonding, could end up going through micro leakage and in time can cause irritation. And that has to do with an inadequate bonding that allows micro leakage of bacteria from the oral environment to take place and the bacteria slowly through the dental tubules can work its way towards the pulp and you end up getting some receding pulp here. In this particular case that we had, there was some semblance of a canal being present at the apex in the apical area, which is the reason why we also had an apical um, lesion. Now, I have found that most of the time when there is an apical lesion in a tooth that looks otherwise fairly calcified, in the vast majority of cases, maybe up to 90% of those cases, you can clinically access and find a canal where there is already a lesion, which is, you know, which makes sense, it's logical. The lesion is there because there is bacteria inside the root canal and the root canal is present. Uh, of course, you could make the argument that it may not be clinically uh, accessible because you know, it could be a highway to bacteria, but from a clinical perspective, it may not be large enough. So here, we did make the access and we found the canal, but again, the, one of the sources of uh, this lesion, which is usually the primary one, uh, the necrosis, is the introduction of bacteria, which is secondary to micro leakage that causes over time, if the micro leakage is, is a slow enough rate, you can have the strophic calcification, which is you know, the natural response of the body to, to ward off the micro leakage and the bacteria, and then that's what ends up happening. Of course, in some cases, it could be even without the presence of any restoration. You could have a tooth that may have a small crack either on top of the tooth in some area of the root, which itself brings the, uh, the leakage. So at, at all point in time, what I'm trying to say basically, the source is always micro leakage, which, whether the source is um, through a inadequately bonded composite restoration, some kind of a decay that is present, a crack, ill-fitting restoration such as crowns and things like that. Uh, those are all various reasons. Of course, uh, occlusal trauma could also be a contributing factor, especially in the case of these canines. So let's look at a side profile of a canine, for example, you know, and these teeth, so if you look at it from the side, you have the bulbous area here in the middle of the tooth, and cuspal deflection from various kind of angles creates a, a traumatic amount of force right in the cervical area of the tooth. And we know from studies that in a small percentage of population, the cementum that normally covers the root and comes all the way to the cement, uh, the cement to enamel junction here is short of the um, of the of this junction so in these cases where your um, the cementum is actually short and you have an area of dentin that is exposed you'll have dentinal tubules that are basically directed directly towards the pulp and uh, the cuspal deflection in combination with the presence of bacteria and saliva in this area can potentially through the capillary effect bring the bacteria in and introduce the bacteria inside the pulp, which will then cause the necrosis. Now, this is very 
most common when I have seen it has always happened in a maxillary canine. And I think it has something to do with the occlusal forces and the way the tooth is, um, is present. The lack of matching of the cementum to the enamel, which will create that little complete closure of the dental tubules, could be secondary to occlusal trauma, which causes some recession, which will then you combine that with the patient's you know, abrasion of the area through uh, brushing, can then expose those dental tubules even more, which will be a, uh, uh, certainly a source of uh, you know, increasing the permeability of dentin in that area. So when you see a tooth that, that a patient that has pain in an area, especially in the maxillary canine area, and you see a tooth, that, a canine tooth that hasn't had any uh, restorations, don't necessarily assume that that's not the source. Make sure that you go through all of your proper diagnostics um, to, to find out if the tooth is in fact vital or necrotic. And that would mean that you have to do your pulp vitality tests. Remember, in this case, it was a little bit easier because you had a tooth that had, this tooth had a peripheral lesion but you may have a canine tooth that is going through the process of necrosis where there is not yet any apical area that would appear on the radiograph, but the patient has all of the acute signs and symptoms of um, irreversible pulpitis or uh, uh, the early stages of a degenerating pulp. So they come and see you for an emergency visit. You take a radiograph of the area where they say they have pain you see no lesions radiographically, and if you're unlucky, that may have a crown uh, or a couple of crowns on the premolar teeth behind this tooth that is actually going, is the source of the pain, and you may misdiagnose the premolar as the, to the source. So just remember that the absence of any restoration or, or even dystrophic calcification is not a sign that that pulp is normal, the pulp could become devitalized uh, as a means of occlusal trauma or even a small restoration that is leaking can bring uh, the source of the bacteria into the pulp and cause necrosis. In this particular case, uh, I would assume that the source was a combination of, of microleakage and this little tiny half moon shaped lesion around the tooth uh, or it could have been combined with occlusal trauma. There's also some systemic situations in which people can have dystrophic calcification, um, but that usually occurs throughout all of the teeth and not just specialized or localized to only one tooth. So that's important to know as well. Um, that's pretty much it. I think uh, the whole goal with this uh, little video was to, to explain to you that to arrive to a proper diagnosis, you need to put in all of the diagnostic tests involved, including your pulp vitality tests. Don't assume that a tooth that is uh, virgin is necessarily vital and is not the source of the patient's chief complaint. Listen to the chief complaint and then try to duplicate it through your uh, clinical tests and uh, this way you would be able to have the proper diagnosis and the proper treatment uh, that uh, uh, the patients uh, always deserve. By the way, one last final thing I wanted to say. In the small percent of patients when you have this short gap, has been postulated to be part of the reason why some patients following root canal therapy, and if you're going to do uh, internal bleaching, let's say for these patients, um, if you put a bleaching agent inside the root here, if your bleaching agent is hydrogen um, uh, superoxal, which is, which is hydrogen peroxide at a high concentration of 30% or even higher, uh, these patients have had in about seven to nine percent of the population end up getting cervical root resorption. And cervical root resorption may be in these types of cases related to the, um, to the lack of cemental coverage of um, this area of the root, um, which could be the source of it. Of course, um, all of this cervical root resorption that is affiliated with internal bleaching has been uh, basically associated with hydrogen peroxide or superoxal. So if you don't use uh, superoxal and basically just use uh, sodium perborate as your main uh, type of your, uh, as a main type of a bleaching agent, you will reduce the odds of that happening. Anyway, it became a little bit of a longer video than I thought it was going to be, but I hope it was of some help to you. I'll see you guys in the next video, and until then, let's save some teeth.